Hello and welcome to the screencast where we're going to cover structures of the brain and cranial nerves. The illustrations you'll see in this presentation are from McKinley's Anatomy and Physiology textbook, University of Michigan's Blue Link, which I highly recommend checking out, and Nutter's Atlas of Anatomy and other various anatomy textbooks and atlases. Before we start discussing the structures in your lab manual, I wanted to bring your attention to what the difference between the cerebrum and the cerebellum is. The cere cerebrum is the main mass of the brain that you typically think of when you think of the brain. But we also have this smaller little brain back uh, here, which is called the cerebellum. That term literally means little brain. And so moving forward, I did my best to go in the order of the structures in your lab manual. So first we'll begin with the superior view of the brain. Here we could see that the brain is divided into a left cerebral hemisphere and a right cerebral hemisphere. And soon we will talk about this space in between that exists, which is called your longitudinal fissure. On the brain, we can also see I'm going to back up here real quick. We can also see a couple different lobes. We have our frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And all of these were named based on the bones that overlie them. This is another view of the brain where we have a anterior view. And in this view, we could see the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe laterally. Dividing the two cerebral hemispheres, we have the longitudinal fissure that is pictured here, or this is also called the mid-sagittal fissure. Now before we discuss any gyri or sulci, I want to discuss what these terms mean. When we look at the brain, we can definitely see that there are convolutions and depressions here. The convoluted portions, or the area that rises up on the brain, is called gyri. That is the plural form. If we're just talking about one elevation, that is a gyrus. The depressions that you see are called sulci. That would be plural, and sulcus is the singular term. So some examples on this brain that we have pictured here would be these gyri, and then the depressions that we see at the purple arrows would be sulci. Moving forward from there, we can now learn about the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus is a part of the frontal lobe and is in charge of motor functions. You may also hear this called the primary motor cortex. Posterior to this area, we have the postcentral gyrus. And this is a part of the parietal lobe and is also called the primary somatosensory cortex. You can remember the order of these functions by thinking it is in alphabetical order. M comes before S, or you can think of the motor goes in the front of the car. Know that both of these gyri are also going to be found on the right hemisphere as well. So it is bilateral. The central sulcus is found between these two gyri and it really just helps, helps to separate out the two cortices. This is another view from APR of the central sulcus. Now let's move into a lateral view. Here I wanted to show you what the pre-central gyrus would look like from this lateral view. And here is a view of the postcentral gyrus. Now let's move into some new terminology. Sitting between the temporal lobe over here and our parietal lobe, which would be above over here, is our lateral sulcus. So once again, this sulcus is a depression and it separates this temporal lobe from the parietal lobe. We can also see back in here is your occipital lobe and this would be your frontal lobe. 
Another fissure we need to be aware of is your transverse cerebral fissure, and that can be found between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Later, we'll talk about some important dural folds that lie within this area. Here's our cerebellum. Here's just another illustration of a mid-sagittal view of the brain, where we would be able to see the midbrain of the brainstem, pons of the brainstem, and the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. I wanted you to be aware of what look, this looks like in a mid-sagittal view so that we understand how we can view it from different perspectives. Here's a cadaveric view of that brainstem. We have the midbrain superiorly, the pons in the middle, and the medulla oblongata inferiorly. Now let's move into inferior views. So when we look at the brain in, from an inferior view, we will see that the frontal lobe, of course, will be the most anterior. Lying inferior to this frontal lobe, we will see the olfactory bulb. This will assist in bringing down cranial nerve number one, which is the olfactory nerve. More on this in the coming slides. Moving posteriorly, we could see our optic nerve. Now this has been transected here because we would see it extending out anteriorly bringing in fibers from the retina of the eye. We'll discuss this optic nerve, also known as cranial nerve number two, later in this screencast. But where these optic nerves continue posteriorly, we will have some fibers cross, creating the optic chiasm. And from there, these fibers will head toward, eventually, the occipital lobe, and these fibers are now called the optic tracts. Continuing posteriorly, that small gray dot in the center is representing the stalk of the pituitary gland. Typically, when we remove the brain from the cranium, the pituitary gland will stay in the cranial cavity. Posterior to this, we will find the mammillary body. And then we could start to see our brainstem structures. So here would be the midbrain. Next, we have the pons. And most inferiorly, we have the medulla oblongata. Continuing down from the medulla oblongata, this area would be the spinal cord. And we, of course, have our cerebellum here. Now let's move into a mid-sagittal view. The highlighted portion is your corpus callosum. This allows the right cerebral hemisphere to communicate to the left cerebral hemisphere. Inferior to that corpus callosum, we have a wall that sits between our two lateral ventricles, and this wall is called septum pellucidum. This makes sense because the word septum means wall. So just to get a better idea of what or where this wall lies, here is a model of the ventricles within the brain. This C-shaped structure here is your lateral ventricle, and this is bilateral. So we also have one on the other side, and the septum pellucidum would sit in between them. Here's your third ventricle. We also have a um, interthalamic adhesion that would sit in this little hole, more on that in chapter 13. And then we have your fourth ventricle in this region here. So below the septum pellucidum, we have your fornix. The fornix means arch in Latin. And this C-shaped structure has nerve fibers that are going to act as a major output tract of the hippocampus. Now I know we haven't talked about the hippocampus just yet, but this hippocampus is going to be a main actor of memory and learning within our brain. Our pineal gland you guys have already seen in lab. We're going to find that posterior to the thalamus, and it is important in regulation of our circadian rhythms. Next, we have the hypothalamus and thalamus that you have also seen in lab already. 
Inferiorly here, we have the hypothalamus, that triangular shaped structure, and then superior to that, we have your thalamus that is more oval shaped and found inferior to the fornix that we just described. Your fourth ventricle is the space that is located anterior to your cerebellum and posterior to the pons. We have your arbor vitae that is called the tree of life. And these fibers in here are myelinated axons. And that's why if I take the highlighted portion away there, you will see white matter moving into the cerebellum here. We also have three different lobes of the cerebellum, but the two that you are responsible for in lab is the anterior lobe and your posterior lobe of the cerebellum. Next, let's look at some brain structures in a transverse cross-section of the brain. So we have sliced the brain in the transverse plane. And the first structure that we could see here is your thalamus. So notice how it is located more toward the um, mid-sagittal plane here. And we do see that it is gray, and that is because we are gonna find many nuclei within the thalamus. Next, we have your anterior horn of the lateral ventricles. So we've mentioned that ventricles are a space, spaces rather, that you will find within the brain. So the lateral ventricle is actually, well, first let's talk about the anterior horn. Here, Anteriorly, we have this space that would serve as the anterior horn of the lateral ventricles. Then that ventricle would course superiorly out through your screen and circle down like an arch posteriorly. Next, we have the corpus callosum. Once again, you are going to just see a portion of this structure here because it will be moving up and toward you out of the screen. So here we have the anterior portion of the corpus callosum. As corpus callosum would continue posteriorly, it would be a three-dimensional way. It would be moving out toward your screen and circling posteriorly. So here we could see a little bit of the posterior aspect of the corpus callosum. Next we have your cerebral gray matter and that we will find on the periphery of the brain. Remember that we have cell bodies of our neurons here. Next, we have the third ventricle, and this will be the space located between the two thalami. I always like to think of the thalami as being two boiled eggs, and technically there is a connection here in between, and that would be that interthalamic adhesion that I mentioned earlier. So all of the space between the two thalami would be your third ventricle. And then we have your caudate nucleus. And this we would find near the anterior horns of your lateral ventricles. And once again, this is gray matter here. So we would find cell bodies within this area. And lastly, we have your lentiform nucleus. This will be found lateral to your thalamus and is made up of structures called your putamen and lobatus pallidus, which we will discuss more in chapter 13. So I realized that there were a couple structures that we had left off of your lab manual. So I'm gonna add them in here. The first section will be about meninges and dural folds. We'll discuss meninges in detail in the lecture portion of your course, but in the lab, you will be able to see the dura mater, anterechnoid mater, and pia mater. When we first open the cranial cavity, you will see that the first layer we run into is the dura mater over here. And dura means tough, mater means mother. So this is the tough mother of the meninges supporting the brain. The other meninge we have is the arachnoid mater. Arachnoid means spider. So we can see that this saran wrap type of tissue that is lifting up off the brain just a bit here 
is the arachnoid mater and is similar to a cobweb or spider web type of consistency. And lastly, we have the pia mater. And the way we would see this is once you peel off the arachnoid mater, that actual brain tissue itself has the pia mater upon it. So it's not necessarily something that we can really see, but I would put a pin into that area where you see the arachnoid mater has been peeled away and ask you what meningitis is being pierced. The only thing left for you to say is pia mater. And pia means intimate. So it is the most intimate with the brain here. Now your dura mater has two different layers and certain areas the two layers are going to fold upon themselves. So one of the areas in which we see this is the falx cerebri, which is pictured over here. This falx cerebri sits within the longitudinal fissure between the right and left hemispheres of the brain, which are not present in this image here. The other dural fold that you can see in this image is called the tentorium cerebelli. So this forms a tent over the cerebellum. And you could see this a bit better in this superior view of the cranial cavity. So this is anterior, this is posterior. The, actually the, um, I just noticed that the tentorium cerebelli has been cut away in this image. So it would be right in this region over here and also in here. The reason I put this image in here is to show you the falx cerebelli down in here. And the falx cerebelli separates the right and left hemispheres of the cerebellum. So careful not to get these two first terms mixed up. Falx cerebri divides the right and left hemispheres of the cerebrum. Falx cerebelli divides the right and left hemispheres of the cerebellum. Now to discuss venous structures within the, or sorry, venous sinuses within the brain. So there are many sinuses, but the three that I want you to know are the superior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, and straight sinus. You can find the superior sagittal sinus at the periphery, superior periphery, of the falx cerebri. So it's this right in here is your superior sagittal sinus. They have opened it up for you to see some clotted blood in here. Yes, there's also an inferior sagittal sinus. You find that at the inferior border of the falx cerebri. I will not be testing you on this. The other thing that um, we can notice here is the straight sinus. So right within this tissue is the straight sinus. The way that blood is flowing is in this direction in the superior sagittal sinus in order to head to an area known as the confluence. If I had a nightclub, I would name it the confluence because everything is traveling to the confluence here. So everyone wants to be there. So we got blood from the superior sagittal sinus traveling there. We mentioned this inferior sagittal sinus. Blood is flowing posteriorly in this direction, drains into the straight sinus, which heads over to the confluence too. Now from the confluence, we will have blood course out laterally through the transverse sinus. So let me show you that transverse sinus. This is once again a superior view looking down into the cranial cavity. So here's my confluence and going out laterally on the right, and on the left, we have your transverse sinus. That would then move into your sigmoid sinus and eventually into your internal jugular vein to continue down in the neck to converge to your brachiocephalic vein to move and drain into your superior vena cava and back to the heart. This is just another view of that straight sinus. So now we can see that tentorium cerebelli in place here. And so that straight sinus is traveling through the mid portion of that thorough fold and transverse sinus once again would be found laterally over here. Now let's move into your cranial nerves. 
Your cranial nerves are set up to be 12 pairs that are associated with the brain, but keep in mind that they belong to the peripheral nervous system. The cranial nerves can be sensory, motor, or both, meaning we can have fibers coursing through the nerve that are motor and some will be sensory. So the way to remember what type of functional classification these cranial nerves have, we can think of this phrase. Some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. And so each of the first letters of these words represent either a sensory neuron, a motor neuron, or both motor and sensory. And they are numbered based on the number of cranial nerves. So some would represent cranial nerve number one, say would represent cranial nerve number two, and Mary would represent cranial nerve number three, and so forth. Whenever we discuss our cranial nerves too, we always utilize Roman numerals when listing them. Here are some other mnemonics for memorizing the names of cranial nerves. Each of the first letters of these words represents the name of a cranial nerve. So we have on occasion, our trusty truck acts funny, very good vehicle anyhow, or we have OOO to touch and feel, very good velvet, ah, heaven. So I know these don't make sense just yet, but as we go through all of the cranial nerves, you could come back to these mnemonics and utilize them if you'd like. There's also, I believe, about over 50 different mnemonics on Wikipedia on how to memorize cranial nerves. So it's all about preference on what you want to use. If we look at an inferior view of the brain, you might see some of the cranial nerves. The ones that you will almost always see from this inferior view in the cadaver lab are the olfactory bulbs that have the olfactory nerves that would exit here, and your optic nerves, which create your optic chiasm and the optic tract. The other ones you may or may not see. I typically will not test you on cranial nerves 3 through 12 from this inferior view. So let's start off with cranial nerve number 1, which is your olfactory nerve. Your olfactory nerve is going to arise from olfactory receptor cells of your nasal cavity. Now remember that your olfactory nerve is purely sensory. So we are going to start off by getting some type of stimulus, which in this case would be a chemical stimulus of smell within the nasal cavity. That nerve will then pass through foramina of the cribriform plate, and I have put this in an image on the right to help you remember what the foramina of the cribriform plate was, and this remember belongs to the ethmoid bone. From there, the fibers will synapse on the olfactory bulb that we just saw in the previous slide. And I wanted to show you this view as well. This is a mid-sagittal view. So here we have your olfactory nerve. It's coursing through the cribriform plate, the foramen of the cribriform plate, connecting through the olfactory bulb. And from there, it is going to travel to the temporal lobe to synapse at the olfactory cortex. Next we have cranial nerve number two, which are the optic nerves. Your optic nerve is going to arise from the retina and pass through the area of the cranial cavity known as the optic canal. Now once they pass through the optic canals bilaterally, they will converge to create the optic chiasm. So you can see some of these nerve fibers do cross over and others do not. Once we get past the optic chiasm, those nerve fibers travel through the optic tract over to a specific nucleus within the thalamus called your lateral geniculate nucleus, where they will synapse. 
From there, we send signals through optic radiation fibers to the visual cortex in your occipital lobe. This is another nerve that is purely sensory information. So we will only find sensory nerve fibers here. Just wanted to show you how you will see this in lab looking into the cranial cavity. So here's your optic nerve. The way I remember this is cranial nerve number two is because optic refers to the eyes and we have two eyes. Next, we're gonna discuss the cranial nerves that exit through the superior orbital fissure. So just to orientate you really quick, this is where your foramen of the cribriform plate was, and this is where your optic canal was. So now this area here is your middle cranial fossa, and they, these little slits here are the superior orbital fissures. So the nerves that will course through here is cranial nerve number three, oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number four, which is your trochlear nerve, cranial nerve V1, 51, which is known as your ophthalmic nerve. Now notice that we said V1, not just V for five, and that's because we will soon learn that cranial nerve number five, known as your trigeminal nerve, will give off three branches. So this is the first branch off of that trigeminal nerve. And lastly, we have cranial nerve number six, your abducent nerve. So we'll start off with cranial nerve number three, your oculomotor nerve. Your oculomotor nerve is going to extend from the ventral midbrain through, pass through the, your superior orbital fissure that we just saw and head over to our excuse me, extrinsic eye muscles four of them total to be specific. And they're gonna function in raising the eyelid and directing the eyeball in certain directions. So I'm not holding you responsible to know all of the muscles that it innervates. We will discuss this more in our special senses lecture. The other job that our oculomotor nerve does is to constrict our iris and it does this through our parasympathetic nervous system. So we have some of the motor fibers in here a part of our parasympathetic nervous system and it will also help to control the lens shape in order to focus our view. So the way I remember what cranial nerve number three is is I think of oculomotor as oculomonster. So I think of it as a triclops monster, which is going to have three eyes, and that'll help me remember cranial nerve number three, and also help me remember that we are going to have some type of function having to do with the eye. So you may be wondering, what is extrinsic eye movement? And there's also something called intrinsic eye movement. So intrinsic eye movement is when we are going to be changing the musculature of your iris to change your pupils. So it would be going from dilated pupil to constricted pupil. Whereas intrinsic eye movement will have to do with actually moving the eyeball around, looking up, looking down, laterally, medially, and so forth. Now let's move into cranial nerve number four, known as your trochlear nerve. These fibers are gonna travel from the dorsal midbrain and enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. It goes to one specific extrinsic eye muscle, and that is your superior oblique muscle. The way I remember this is trochlear reminds me of the word tractor, and how many wheels does a tractor have? Four. Also, you may not see the trochlear nerve in the lab. It is a very small nerve because it's heading over just to one muscle. Um, and so usually when we take the brain out of the cranial cavity, this nerve ends up tearing and we, if we're lucky, we might see just a small portion of it. Now let's move into cranial nerve number five, which is our trigeminal nerve. This is going to be the largest of cranial nerves. It's this one right over here. And these fibers are extending from the pons over to the face.
like I mentioned, it has three divisions. So let's talk about that real quick. V1 is going to be your ophthalmic nerve, and that exits at the superior orbital fissure, like we mentioned earlier. V2 is your maxillary nerve and will exit at this foramen rotundum. It's just a round hole, like the name says. And cranial nerve V3, which is your mandibular nerve, and this exit exits via the foramen ovale. So the hole that looks like an oval. Now let's discuss some of the functions of your trigeminal nerve. Moving back to this slide. Some of the main functions of your trigeminal nerve is to innervate the muscles of mastication. So if you put your hands on your cheeks and you clench your jaw or drop it and raise it or depress and elevate it, I should say, you may feel some of your muscles of mastication working. Specifically, that would be your masseter muscle. We also have sensory impulses that are coming from areas of the face that are um, conveyed through V1, V2, and V3, but V3 is going to be the one that has a lot of the motor fibers that innervate those muscles of mastication. So moving on to how we memorize this. One, we must know that the trigeminal, trigeminal nerves branches into the ophthalmic nerve, maxillary nerve, and mandibular nerve. So how do we remember trigeminal? It is because tri means three, and gemini, means twin, so you think of the number two, so three plus two would be five, of course. So that is how we remember cranial nerve number five is trigeminal. Now to talk about the specific functions of each of these nerves, starting off with V1, the ophthalmic nerve. So you can also remember some of these functions by holding up your three fingers to your face, like the image on the right side here. This is actually a picture of my husband that I took when I first started teaching. I think he's about 21 years old here, <laughs> so it was quite a while ago. But V1, you could see, is headed over to the eye. And so we are going to see sensory impulses coming over from that upper eyelid and also the anterior scalp and nose. We will also have sensory information coming in from the nasal cavity, mucosa, the cornea of the eye, which would be that um, portion where you see the colored area and your pupil, although it's not those actual structures, it's kind of like the window to the eye, and also the lacrimal gland. Now if we look at V2, that's heading over to where your maxilla bone is. And so we will have sensory impulses coming from the nasal cavity mucosa once again, your palate, your upper teeth, skin of your cheek, upper lip, and your lower eyelid. And lastly, we have V3, which is in the region of your mandible bone. So we are getting sensory impulses from the anterior tongue, lower teeth, skin of your chin, temporal region of our scalp. And we also have our motor fibers in here. And that is going to innervate our muscles of mastication. And we also have proprioceptor fibers here. This is just an illustration of the region of sensory impulses that come from V1, 2, and 3. And you can also see the muscles of mastication here that V3 is innervating. Now let's move into cranial nerve number six, your abducens nerve, which is the last one to, woo, to leave the brainstem at this point. It is inferior pons and exit out the superior orbital fissure. From there, we are going just to one muscle, and that is your lateral rectus muscle. This muscle will help to abduct or laterally move the eyeball. And so we have primarily motor fibers helping us do this to innervate this lateral rectus muscle. If this nerve were to be lesioned, then the eyeball would be adducted or medially um, rotated. So how do we remember cranial nerve number six is your abducent nerve? We can remember 
ab because everybody wants a six pack of abs and it helps us remember the function of abducting the eye which is an extrinsic eye movement and this always makes me remember the situation and him being known for his abs next we have cranial nerve number seven which is your facial nerve so this nerve is going to exit out this area called the internal acoustic meatus. It is going to travel from the pons through that internal acoustic meatus and emerges through this area known as the stylomastoid foramina. And it actually courses through the parotid gland, which is not pictured here. But once it passes that gland, it then gives off five major branches. So I can show you, we remember the branches by holding up the hand onto the face. These five branches are known as the temporal branch, zygomatic branch, the buccal branch, mandibular branch, and cervical branch. The major functions of the facial nerve would be motor functions that will help us with facial expression, so it innervates all of these muscles of the face, and parasympathetic impulses to our lacrimal gland and our salivary glands. The sensory function of the facial nerve would be taste, specifically from the anterior, anterior two-thirds of our tongue. So you can see that we have both motor and sensory fibers here. So the way I remember this cranial nerve number seven being the facial nerve is when I went to this Mediterranean restaurant that no longer exists in Michigan called Lashish, I was sitting with my friend and the waiter comes over and he says, how old are you? And I say, oh, I'm 17. I'm feeling, you know, like, oh, I'm about to graduate high school and go to college feeling all mature. And the waiter says, huh? I thought you were 15. Lucky face. And I thought, what does lucky face mean? And I don't want to look like I'm 15. I want to look more mature at this point in my life. So that later on, when I entered college and took my anatomy course, was a blessing because now I can remember lucky number seven is lucky facial nerve. Next, we have cranial nerve number eight, which is your vestibulocochlear nerve. Here we are going to have your vestibular cochlear nerve leave inferior from the pons and head through that internal acoustic meatus once again. But we have two separate divisions of this nerve. We have a cochlear division that is in charge of hearing and a vestibular division that is in charge of equilibrium or balance. As you can imagine, this is mostly a sensory type of function, but we do have a small motor component here that will help to adjust the sens sensitivity of the receptors within the inner ear. Here is your internal acoustic meatus, just as a reminder of where that exit is for our vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, if someone were to have a tumor near this area known as a acoustic neuroma that might impinge upon either your facial nerve or your vestibulocochlear nerve and so we know that the effects that this would have would be issues with our hearing or balance or it might even affect our uh, muscles of facial expression and the way i remember what cranial nerve number eight is is I think of the cochlea all curled up like the number eight. So that helps me remember vestibulocochlear nerve. Next, we have cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. This nerve is going to exit from the medulla to leave our skull via this large opening here called the jugular foramen. And you'll see that three nerves will exit through this hole. And our glossopharyngeal nerve is going to head over to our throat or our pharynx. So we have some motor functions here, and that is to innervate part of the tongue and our pharynx to assist with swallowing. 
And we will also have parasympathetic fibers to our parotid gland, which is pictured. Our sensory functions will be to conduct taste, specifically from the posterior one-third of the tongue, and also general sensory impulses from the pharynx and posterior tongue, and impulses from our carotid chemoreceptors and baroreceptors that we learned in the previous quarter. This is just an image of innervations to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and the posterior one-third of the tongue. Remember that glossopharyngeal nerve is responsible for sensory innervation of the posterior one-third of the tongue and also conveying taste. So the way I remember cranial nerve number nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve is I think of glosso meaning tongue and I think of curling the tongue up almost like the number nine. So I know this one is a stretch, but it works for me. So that would be glossopharyngeal cranial nerve number nine. There's the number nine, like a curled tongue. <laughs> Next we have cranial nerve number 10, which is your vagus nerve. This is going to be the only cranial nerve that extends beyond the head and the neck region. It is our longest cranial nerve that we have. So fibers will exit through the medulla and head toward the jugular foramen of the skull to exit here. The motor fibers within the vagus nerve are mostly parasympathetic and will help regulate activities of our heart, our lungs, abdominal organs, specifically the smooth muscle in that area. And we also do have sensory nerve fibers here too. We're gonna to carry impulses from our thoracic and abdominal viscera, also the baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, and taste buds on the posterior tongue and pharynx. The way I remember cranial nerve number 10 is the vagus nerve, as I think of the club in Vegas known as XS and um, so obviously X refers to the number 10 and Vegas, even though it's spelled differently, is like the city Vegas in Nevada. Las Vegas, of course, is what I'm referring to. The other thing is it takes a long time to travel from Illinois to Nevada or Vegas. And so this nerve is the most well-traveled its name, Vegas, actually comes from the term vagabond, meaning wanderer. So it wanders all, I shouldn't say all throughout the body, but definitely the furthest of all the cranial nerves. Next, we have cranial nerve number 11, which is your accessory nerve, or sometimes it's referred to as your spinal accessory nerve. And this is because it is debated as to whether this is a true cranial nerve because it is formed from rootlets of, I should say, ventral rootlets of C1 to C5 from the spinal cord. Then it enters the cranial cavity and exits out the jugular foramen. So it is traveling through two foramen to be specific. First, that foramen magnum, the largest hole in the cranium here, and then back out through the jugular foramen. So we say it has dual origin, both the brain and spinal cord. And its job is to exit and continue down to the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So just as a reminder, here is your trapezius muscle and here is your sternocleidomastoid. Whew, we finally made it to cranial nerve number 12, the hypoglossal nerve. This nerve exits from the medulla and heads over to the skull to exit via the hypoglossal canal. And you can find this canal anterior and just superior to your foramen magnum. And its job is to innervate extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue that'll contribute to swallowing and speech. The very last thing I want to do is show you what these nerves are going to look like in the cadaver lab. So you may want to come back and revisit this after you have even seen them in the cadaver lab in order to refresh your memory when you are not in there. So we see anteriorly, here's your crystagalli and the foramina of the cribriform plate. 
We do not see the olfactory bulb here because usually it stays adhered to the brain. What we can see posterior to this is our optic canal here transmitting that optic nerve. Now inferior to that, you might see this open vessel here, and that is going to be your internal carotid artery. So on top we have your optic nerves, and then below that we have your internal carotid arteries. So I kind of like to think of this area as a rectangle box. So at the top of my box corners, I have the optic nerves, and then like we said, inferior to that is the inferior carotid artery. In the center of my box, this is where I have my pituitary gland. So here you see a little bit of the stalk poking out, and then your pituitary gland is sitting within the cella turcica here. At the inferior corners of my box, you will see this nerve here. This is cranial nerve number three, also known as your oculomotor nerve. Now beyond that, we could see this petrous portion of bone which is your temporal bone, to be specific. At the very beginning of that petrous portion, you will find this teeny tiny nerve here, and that is cranial nerve number four, your trochlear nerve. To find cranial nerve number five, just look on the posterior ridge here, and this thick nerve is trigeminal, cranial nerve number five. Medial and inferior to that, you have these long strands that serve as your abducens nerve or cranial nerve number six. Now beyond that, if you know your exits, you will know what nerves um, are coursing through them. So here's your internal acoustic meatus. We mentioned how cranial nerve number seven, your facial nerve, and cranial nerve number eight, vestibulocochlear nerve, course through this meatus. No, you will not have to identify the specific nerve, whether this one is facial and this one is vestibulocochlear. I will just ask you to name the nerves found in this exit, and you will have to tell me cranial nerve 7 and 8 and give me the specific names there. The next opening we see here is the jugular foramen. So here we will find cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11. You can specifically find cranial nerve 11 here because you will find that part of it is coming from the spinal cord. So you'll see part of this nerve transmitting the foramen magnum, moving up to exit out the jugular foramen. And then the last one we will find is going to be your um, hypoglossal nerve exiting out the hypoglossal canal, which is right over here. And that is cranial nerve number 12. So that is it for your pre-laboratory one screencast. Please let me know if you have any questions before we head over to lab.